Far too many people are not chasing their dreams and not pausing to reconsider a different path, whether it be in their career, in their relationships, to really get the most out of life. That many people have an unsettled feeling inside of them that they were meant to do something more. In this episode of The Creator Community, we'll meet Angela Schroeder, a mother and lifelong entrepreneur with relentless energy to grow and loan her courage. We'll hear how Angela built her coaching business, learned how to borrow courage, and face difficult conversations again and again. We'll then follow Angela's journey of courage that starts each day at 4.30 in the morning and how that early start and following routines has empowered her to take more risks in her career and publish her new book, The Courageous Mind. Check out the show. Welcome to the Creator Community. This is a podcast from book publisher, New Degree Press. I'm your host, John Saunders. This show is designed to celebrate, elevate, and showcase many of the incredible authors that have published their books with NDP. This year, NDP will cross over 1,300 published authors from six continents and has recently earned the 293rd spot on the Inc. Magazine 5000 list. This is the fastest growing privately held companies in America. This is episode three of season four, and today I have with me Angela Schroeder. Angela is an entrepreneur, speaker, coach, connector, lifelong learner, and now author. She's passionate about empowering leaders to live courageously and develop phenomenal cultures. With over 25 years of experience in launching and growing businesses and building successful teams, Angela has learned that it all starts with leading and knowing yourself well. Angela shared her self-discovery with thousands of business leaders globally, growing their mindset, businesses, and lives through a company she founded, Courageous Solutions and Strategies. Angela's mission is to guide business leaders to a courageous mindset, putting mediocrity eternally behind them, and achieving phenomenal results, both professionally and personally. Angela, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here with you. Absolute pleasure to have you here. You know, you've done a lot in your career as I looked through your profile and, and did a little bit of research on you. Can we share a little bit about more what that journey was like and how that led you to where you are today? Yes. So I graduated from the University of Nebraska with a degree in psychology, but was raised with this entrepreneurial spirit. My dad was an entrepreneur and now a big part of my upbringing. So I knew I would own a business. I just didn't know what that would look like. Right after college, I started a dance and gymnastics studio back in my hometown of Aurora, Nebraska. And combined my passion of teaching dance with owning a business and and pouring into lives of young students. I soon combined that with business consulting, helping other dance studio owners across the country grow their business by operating more effectively and efficiently and ultimately growing their, their bottom line. After that, I had a season in Mary Kay where I drove a pink Cadillac for several years and led other women in building their business and continued with the business consulting as we moved to Omaha, Nebraska. And then most recently, as you said, launched Courageous Strategies and Solutions, a business to help business professionals and business owners spend more time operating in their own unique genius and which is what they do best working in their strengths and what fuels their fire and delegate the rest through the use of virtual assistants. I really like that thought operating in your own or their own unique genius. And you've clearly found a way to help people do that. And what a journey you've been on the Mary Kay pink Cadillac. I can see it rolling. There was one in my town when I grew up, always rolling around town. And I thought, who is that person? But I love that you've been able to marry your passion with your purpose and something that you're really good at, which is helping unlock people's strengths. So what a great story. So how did all this lead you and, and help you find this author coaching thing? Where did the writing a book hit your radar screen? My dream of writing a book actually began as a little girl on my grandma's front porch. My grandma Jane lived next to us on the farm and she had the best collection of old books. And I would tape over the author's name with masking tape and write my own and carry those books around with pride. Fast forward to about 15 years ago, and I was sitting on my own front porch in Aurora, Nebraska with my kids playing in the front lawn. And I read a book called Five Wishes by Gay Hendricks. And it walked you through an exercise of what 
five things that you wish you wanted to do before you died for your life to be a complete success. Fast forward again to about exactly a year ago, and I was pulling a book off my shelf and that book came with it and the handwritten note fell out of the things I wrote 15 years ago, the five wishes. And one of those five wishes I'd written on that paper was to write a book and speak about it. So the gravity started to sink in (laughs) that in 15 years, I really hadn't moved that dream on my heart forward. And I got a call from a friend to go to a last minute event and photo shoot. And I really didn't want to go. I wanted to just sit there and wallow (laughs) in In your lost um, dreams. (laughs) Yes. in in Lost dreams. But something told me I needed to go to the event. And when I arrived, I met James Mansky and he told me he had just written a book. After the event was over, we stayed and talked for hours. He told me about the book creators program and what he had just gone through with Eric Custers and how he was paired with editors. And over a year that this program took him through every aspect of writing a book. I knew that that conversation was divine appointment. I had just been smacked in the face with my lifelong dream a little bit earlier. And then I now was learning from someone who just had written a book. So later that week, connected me with Eric and my journey of making my lifelong dream of writing a book began. That is so interesting. All the sort of touch points along the way of creation and fascination for reading and wanting to be an author and then writing this wish out and and then the note falling out of the book. I love it. And then of course, finding the, you know, someone who'd gone through the program you know, how did you fit this thing in, into your life, Angela? Right? It's you're already a busy person. You've got a family. How do you find time to write a book? Yeah, it was just really a, a passion of mine and on my heart. And I think being attached to that why helped as well. But this program ultimately made it possible to interweave it in with running a business and and doing life because they guide you in every single step of the way and hold you accountable. So break it into little bite-sized pieces as you're working, taking classes and learning and learning from great authors, and then being able to work one-on-one with an editor who is giving you a timeline and here's what to do next. And really, like I said, spread it into bite-sized pieces over a year and, and having a cheerleader there to keep you motivated and accountable. Two important parts there, right? The 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 cheerleader, the, the accountability partner, and the well, and then of course the bite-sized chunks. Uh, I love that. So the courageous mind out this spring 2022, late spring 2022. When what is the courageous mind? What's it about, Angela? It is about using courage to create more abundance in every area of your life. And the book walks through stories of my own journey of courage and some fascinating stories of people in my life and people that I've met from my cousin, Amy Lou Emanuel Bassett, who is a colonel in the Air Force, and what it's like to be have courage in being a high-ranking woman in the military and using courage and practicing it every day so that you can automatically use courage in a combat situation and, and also personal things of using courage and overcoming breast cancer. The stories of lots of community leaders and things that they've overcome, drugs, failures, divorce, a journey of personal growth, and then lots of successful entrepreneurs who take big risks over and over. And learning from those stories of other people and tying that all together was honestly one of my favorite parts of writing the book. As I did those interviews, I thought I could do this every day, interview people and really seek to understand how their stories led them to where they are. And then it really all ties together in, in how courage is one of the correlations of the most successful and happiest people. I really appreciate that this has been, I feel like this moment has been a lifelong journey for you, right? Growing up the daughter of an entrepreneur and then getting on to writing the book and, and going along this journey of learning and growth. You know, how did this concept of this courageous mindset, how did it first enter your radar screen? When was this first kind of like, oh, this is a thing, this courageous mindset? Where do you think that happened? Yes. So I have always been a huge Brene Brown fan 
And she talks a lot about courage and getting outside your comfort zone and being vulnerable. So that's always been an area of curiosity for me. And last year, each year I pick a word of the year that's going to define my year on January 1st. And last year, the word I picked was courageous. And I often make a big sign, which I did. It's the sign that's behind me. And so that was my word of the year last year is I was going to learn all about courage and being courageous. And so when my book journey began and I knew I was in the program and writing the book I've always wanted to write, I just knew that this was the area that I wanted to explore. Inspired by Brene Brown, having this concept sitting on your wall as a reminder each and every day. I love that. So, you know, even though you talked about bite-sized chunks and having the cheerleader and having the accountability partner, it still takes a lot of work, right? And and energy to get this done, which oftentimes takes a big mission, a big why. Angela, what was your why to get this book off the ground, The Courageous Mind? I believe far too many people are not chasing their dreams and not pausing to reconsider a different path, whether it be in their career, in their relationships, to really get the most out of life that many people have an unsettled feeling inside of them that they were meant to do something more because they're not chasing some dream. We're all born with courage, but I believe that courage gets buried deep inside of us sometimes after failures or trauma, and we end up in this unfulfilled, unhappy place, forgetting that we have the courage to get ourselves out. And I was very much in that place the night that I arrived at the event and met James Mansky and my job book journey began. I had started my first business, as I said, right out of college and was doing what set my soul on fire every single day, dancing and teaching and building a business and mentoring other business owners. And I had tons of success early in business and financial success and looked well, it looked to everyone else like I was living a dream. But after two abusive marriages and divorces and walking away from all of that, I was really in a place of stuck and barely surviving. And that night, James breathed belief into me, kind of yanked me out of that place of mediocrity and unveiled the champion spirit that had always been inside me. And I not only began my author journey that week, but left a job of building someone else's dream and went back to my own company and building my own dream again. So I really had a passion for that. Sometimes we just need someone to come alongside us and loan us their courage, fan the flames for us until we can launch again. And that no matter where anyone is at on their journey, it's not too late to make a decision to face your fears and make all those dreams inside your heart come true. That is what an incredible story of inspiration. And I really appreciate this concept of we're born with courage and, it, you know, we sort of get beaten down in life for, you know, different failures or one reason or another. And we feel like, gosh, can I ever be courageous again? And yet you found a way through being inspired and putting yourself out there and continuing to learn and grow. That is awesome. You know, how have you seen courageous actions have positive impact on leaders throughout your career and some of your coaching that you've done? Where have you seen, how have you seen that play out? Yeah, I believe every time that we choose to be courageous, it strengthens our courage muscle, that we get stronger and stronger in that courage each time that we do it. And I think leaders do that intentionally. And as they do that intentionally, it creates a a culture of courage. And when I was in Mary Kay, I think that was one of the greatest examples of being courageous and learning from courageous leaders, and then passing on that courage as well. So in that culture, it wasn't just people speaking and motivating and saying great words, that you were actually watching people make decisions, go outside their comfort zone, do something, make big asks, whether it be about the product or the opportunity in that scenario. And then they came alongside you and helped you make big asks and step outside your comfort zone over and over again. And then it was the culture of that. Then the people that I led, the hundreds of women I had the privilege of being on my team, it was doing that. It was helping them have the courage to make those big asks. And when you led like that and were able to help other people have courage in that situation, which happened to be a career situation, it overflowed into all areas of their life. And I think that's one of the unique things about courage. We can choose to go skydiving or or some, you know, 
get over some personal fear of needles or something that scares us and it spills over into every other area of our lives. And so that's why I think it's the greatest way to lead is because when you lead and and help other people have courage, it just spills over into their whole life. You know, courage or excuse me, culture is what, what we do, how we, what we say, how we interact with each other. And no matter what we do, our culture is going to evolve, isn't it? And it's what, how we take on these actions and words that define it. And so what a fantastic story of this culture of, of empowerment and enabling that you felt throughout the Mary Kay experience and certainly incorporated to your own business. You know, one of the things you talked about in the book is this courageous conversations, right? Why, why is that important? What do we need to know about courageous conversations? Courageous conversations has become one of my favorite topics of the book, hence the like big smiles and excitement over it. And one of my favorite things that I now get asked the most to speak to businesses and teams about is courageous conversations. And there's a chapter in the book uh, titled Uncomfortable Conversations. And that chapter was actually born when early in the book, journey, I got a text message from someone I care about that was unexpected, caught me off guard, really tugged at my emotions and hit me in a way I didn't expect and probably should have been a conversation and not just a text message. And that inspired me to write some quotes for social media. I do that a lot on my social media. There's lots of quotes that come get incorporated in the book on uncomfortable conversations and not hiding behind technology. And those quotes gained a lot of popularity. <laughs> and it was it was definitely a, a topic that resonated with people. And so I made it a topic in the book. Every single interview that I did for the book, a question they got asked was, tell me about the most uncomfortable conversation you ever had and what came from it. And Man, the importance of having conversations early is just so important. It decreases the anxiety of the unknown. It fosters a greater understanding before emotions get too intense. I mean, we all dread uncomfortable conversations. And so most people just shy away from them and avoid them. But the most successful and happiest people have uncomfortable conversations early and very often, because they lead to more understanding. They lead to a better um, opportunity to work together, to be vulnerable, both in personal and professional relationships. In business, a lot of people don't ask for what they want, right? And that's, you know, sales conversations are uncomfortable. That's why salespeople are paid so high. They're willing to have uncomfortable conversations over and over again. But our willingness to do those allows us to grow exponentially in business to be ask for what we want and and not leave things unsaid because that's when crazy things happen. So I just believe it takes your life to the next level when you're willing to have those conversations, ask for what you need, say the unpopular thing, that that's how we, our relationships and ourselves best grow to the next level. A wise mentor once said to me, you know, you're not really a great leader until someone's shared very strongly that they totally disagree with something that you mm. said, right? Sometimes you've got to put a stake in this ground and say, yes, Hey, this is how I think we need to get things done here. I might be wrong. I might be right, but this is how I think we need to move forward or, or whatever the case may be. I think, you know, the unfortunate times when I had to let people go in my career, I mean, talk about an uncomfortable conversation where you literally lose sleep over it or with difficult client conversations. I was in sales for many years. I mean, literally like couldn't sleep the night before these calls, but once I got through those calls, I mean, such an inflection point in that relationship, in that career move, whatever it might be, a super important. What is one of your favorite courageous conversations from the book? <laughs> like so I said, many, there's so, so many, many awesome. Teachers. But um, one is a personal conversation. One of my good friends and fellow uh, business owners in this community, Felicia um, Janovich, shared a story about she was deciding between her dad and her stepdad, which her stepdad came into her life at a very young age. It was coming up to her wedding and who she was going to have walk her down the aisle. Oh boy. And she, this, the thought of this conversation made her sick literally for years. And then once she went to have the conversation, both of them were great with them both doing it. And so it was really about that, how, how much turmoil she had given herself for years of her life, like how much she had lost stress, worry, 
all this over not having the conversation in the beginning because she was worried about something that didn't exist and wasn't didn't hurt either one of the people. She was worried about a hurt that wasn't even there. And I think those are kind of the the worst case scenario of things we don't do. We make up this worry in our head. And if we would just have the conversation early, we would have avoided all that. Saved all this pain and anguish. And as you said, mm-hmm. great leaders do this all the time. And it, you get more used to it. You get more comfortable with it over time. And uh, what a powerful story to share. And as you, we build these things up in our minds to something that, right, so much bigger than what they are. And she opened the door to these, this conversation and lo and behold, they found a very, sounds like a pretty quick solution, which was sharing the moment, which is awesome. So this mindset, this, this courageous mindset, you know, you talked also in the book about guarding and growing this mindset. How does that affect or impact courage for somebody? I believe that we can take more risks and make more courageous decisions when we are in the proper mindset. And one example of that, I think there's several, um, but one example of that is the power of our daily routine. That when we've already established daily habits and a routine, we don't need to use willpower to make most of our decisions during the day. So we don't use willpower or all that decision-making energy to make all those things. And we have that energy left to make big courageous decisions. So I have been uh, passionate about learning from other people's morning routine and having a disciplined one myself and have it throughout the day. And just for example, like my day starts at a, a pretty insane time for some people. I wake up every day at 4.30, no matter what. It's not a decision that's already taken off the table. That's when I work out. That's when I do my journaling, affirmations, I do some reading, the things I know I want to get done in the day, but it's not a decision I need to make. I have already set myself up for success. Those activities also boost your your mindset and grow your mindset, right? Journaling in the morning, soaking in some great information from reading, getting the endorphins of exercising, and then telling yourself how great you are with some affirmations. So setting that up, and then it goes on throughout the day. Like how many decisions can you already plan out and have it? Do you meal prep and have your meals done? I wear black almost every single day. And that's a decision because I don't have to decide what I'm wearing. So the more things that you can take off the plate of having to make a decision about each day, the more energy you have left to make big decisions. And that in in research, I knew that was true for me, but in research, that was a a huge correlation in successful people and the power of their morning routine and the power of the decisions that they make throughout the day. I I love this idea and the analogy you used of wearing black every day to make the decision simple. You know, when I worked on Wall Street, I just wore a suit every day. It was actually genius because, right, what do I wear today? I wear a suit. Which one of these ones do I put on, right? For someone who maybe isn't familiar with this mindset and have some of these habits and might not have some of these habits built out, Angela, where, how do they start to prioritize some of these things? What can I sort of automate in my life so I don't for like let the big decisions? How do you find that balance between those or how do you prioritize those to find the right balance? So I think it starts with taking inventory of what you do. So writing down what it is you do each day, maybe for a week, what does that look like? And then taking a look at what things you do. And these are everything you do from brushing your teeth to the meals you eat to, you know, every single thing. And then taking a look at that and what can become part of a routine that, that I don't have to think about that I make my bed every time I get up and it's not a decision whether I'm going to make my bed or, you know, just any decision-making that you can do on that. When you analyze what you do throughout the day, it also, I mean, has so many other benefits of some things you're not realizing, like maybe that's not a habit. I do that every day. Maybe that's not a great habit that's supporting growing my mindset and growing my life. I mean, you might look of, wow, I was on social media for four hours (laughs) and maybe that's not a great habit. Maybe I can replace that with something else, but I think it really starts by taking inventory. And I think uh, successful people do that, take that inventory over and over again and are analyzing, okay, what can I take and put this as part of a routine? Maybe working out is important to you, but you are scattered in working out. And I think that's an easy example of putting it into a routine because a lot of people are like, yeah, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to work out. 
But then if you don't have it planned out, you're thinking about it all day long. That's why I do it first. I have friends that are like, ah, I really should work out, but I'd rather go do this. So then all day they're thinking about if they're going to work out and when they're going to fit that in instead of it's an absolute. I really appreciate this idea of taking this inventory because sometimes we don't even see it. And really, if we don't see it, we can't measure it, right? And see what's working and what's not working. And then visually giving ourselves the chance or, and mentally to, to do that prioritization. What a great exercise and far from complex, but a powerful one. I remember Eric Custer had a guest speaker on for one of his speaker series sessions, Noah Kagan, one of the first employees at Facebook. And his line around this, I thought was great. He said, set your goals, constantly check on them. If you aren't hitting your goals, check your calendar was the way he said it very simply. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like a, a similar thing here with a lot more practicality attached to how you described it. Couldn't agree with you more. When I was a sales person on Wall Street, I constantly was refining my touch strategies. So I didn't have to think about it. How often should I talk to this client? I worked on the cadence and landed on it and just ran with that and uh, figured it out. And it ended up working pretty well over time. So really powerful, practical exercise. Courage. Why is it not more common, do you think, out there? I think in the world that we have so much going on in our lives right now, it's easy to get stuck living on autopilot and not really on purpose, that people are just so consumed with the obligations of their daily lives and just getting it done and getting it done and are end up thinking they're happy living in comfortable and that far too many people are settling for that, that they're just settling for comfortable. So uh, they're not even thinking about courage because they think, why do I need to be courageous? I'm just going to sit here in my comfortable everyday routine and, and not rock the boat. And as that happens, we end up in environments and circles of influence and people in our lives that are all the same way, that are kind of supporting our comfortableness <laughs> and nobody rock the boat. And if everyone around me isn't rocking the boat or doing anything courageous, then I'm just fine in my comfort zone too. And it's when we take a moment to stop and analyze, are we really happy or are we just comfortable? Is there something else greater on the other side? And maybe break out of that circle that somebody different enters our life or we see something different that inspires us to make a change and be courageous. And that goes back to all that, that mindset stuff is then you know, being courageous on purpose requires choosing to be in those environments on purpose and surround yourself with people that on purpose challenge you and will call you out when you are not being courageous and you're just being uncomfortable. Just like you diving into these different entrepreneurship ventures over years, diving into the book exercise and, and the, the book program, unbelievable. So taking inventory, being aware, setting up making efficiency in our lives where we can and taking the important things and making sure they happen every day. What are some other common traits that successful leaders you found that really at the end of the day, you keep alluding to this, right? Successful people take risks. You know, what are some of the traits they do to, to get them there? So one of the big ones I kind of alluded to in the last question, but is intentionally surrounding themselves with people and environments that support taking risks and making courageous decisions. They are not just with people who are, a harsh way of putting it, is champions of victim mentality or okay with the status quo, but they really always put themselves in environments and with people. I think that's the first most important decision that you, you're not always going to be courageous. You're not always going to be feeling, you know, you're going to go through moments of defeat as entrepreneurs and as courageous people. We're not always winning. And when you're in those moments of not winning, you need people around you in an environment that's, let's get up and go again, that holds you accountable for the things that you've put in place for yourself. So we talked about the daily habits in the morning routine and successful people have those in common too. They are choosing environments and people and habits and routines. But when things happen, I think the first pillar is those environments and people because they're going to say, what the heck? Why didn't you go to the gym this morning? Or <laughs> something's off. Let, let's get these other foundations back so that you have a greater bounce back ability when you've put those systems in, um, in place for yourself. So 
those, those people and environments help support the bounce back ability. And they also just constantly challenge you to go to a different level when you're around those people, they're, they're calling you out and and challenging you to do something more and you're watching them do more. So it's, it's this ripple effect because courage is contagious. I've heard a variety of sources on who this quote goes back to, but you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I've heard a few different sources of who that goes back to. So I'm not sure who it is, but I think it's a good one. And you allude to it here, right? If, if you have a, a, a tough day at work and you go to your, your, five most common people you talk to and they say, oh, well, work just stinks once in a while. And that's how it is, mm-hmm. right? As opposed to challenging you on what could you have done differently? How could you approach that differently? What does your calendar look like? I mean, what a uh, what a fantastic exercise to make all of these things come to life and, and finding that accountability. And I think if friends around you and your community aren't challenging you, I, I'm with you. I think there's a maybe another place to go and, and find a better way for yourself. So speaking of all these challenges and this, this growth you've been on, Angela, you know, how would you say that this book journey has changed you? You know, what have you learned about yourself along the way in this big challenge you've taken on? So much. I think my greatest takeaway is there are two types of courage. And one is how I always divine, defined courage before. And that is suiting up with armor and running into the fire doing big, brave things, everything that we've really talked about so far of taking risks, taking risks that other people admire, that people look at and say, wow, that was brave, starting those businesses, walking onto a big stage, skydiving, you know, all the big things that people see as bravery. But I believe the other type of courage is being willing to shed all that armor and surrender to being vulnerable. And being willing to see first your own flaws, which is difficult, and then letting a close circle of people around you at least see that as well and being really true and authentic. The next step is really being true and authentic to more and more people in the world. But that is, I think that type of courage takes even more strength or or more courage for that second one. And that's not really what most people think courage is and not a thing I ever thought of before, but this book journey was a lot about learning that second time of courage, second part of courage and really being willing to grow and shed that armor, be vulnerable with my own story. And because of that, doing a lot of work on myself and healing from experiences And that's really something, one of the most important things we can do as leaders that I didn't know at the beginning of this book journey of how important it was to really be vulnerable and recognize things about yourself and heal those things first so that you could be better for other people. Right. If you don't figure out your own challenges first, it's hard to help others with with their problems. And I, I really appreciate this concept of being vulnerable, being your authentic self to others and seeing how they react to that. And many times we're afraid to put that, you use the armor analogy earlier, we're afraid to take off that armor and show ourselves to people because who knows what they might say. We might not like it. And maybe then we discover that they're maybe not the five people who should be the average of our lives, or maybe they are. And we could build on that relationship even further, but you don't know unless you do this, right? And my life has certainly taught me that vulnerability breeds vulnerability in others. And I, I find that a very powerful way to grow. So I really appreciate that example. When you think about the overall journey and and your career and any aspect of this book, what's been an unexpected positive for you with the book? So I learned a lot about how I take feedback and how to better (laughs) take feedback and to grow at a skill. I like many successful people, I think, think I'm really great at a lot of things. And that what I put out there was really great, right? (laughs) And so constructive feedback wasn't always something that I took well or worked with well. And I had the most incredible editors that I got to work with, the most incredible editors. I became very close to them and they were not only the best editors and teachers and coaches, but cheerleaders and really oftentimes a therapist as well. Before writing this book, I had no idea the intensity of the editing process. I mean, I think I envisioned editing as grammar and punctuation. And really editing was completely rewriting and learning how to become a better writer. And I remember at the beginning of the journey, Eric telling us and several other authors telling us that you're going to turn in a really crappy rough draft. (laughs) And we'll help you make it a beautiful finished product. And I didn't 
realize what that process was so much like, but I learned so much about not only becoming a better writer, but a better learner that you're not always right. (laughs) And, you know, someone else knows how to do it better and you need to be a good learner and look at something from a different perspective and be willing to redo and redo again and redo again and learn in the process. That learning to, to take feedback as an unexpected positive is a really uh, fascinating answer to me on that and being constructive and thank you as constructive rather than attack against you. Right. As I remember when I got the first big set of feedback for my book, I was like, this guy's a jerk. What is he talking about? He doesn't know what he's talking about. After I read it for maybe the third time, it hit me. I was like, Oh, I did do something weird here. I need to change this paragraph or this sentence or whatever it was. And so it's hard. So can you think of that moment where that moment arose for you, where you thought, you know, this feedback, I felt you were feeling attacked by it, but then you realized, oh, wait, oh. this is here to help me. I I was like, I have the same feeling <laughs> over and over again. Every new editor. I remember with my first editor, the developmental editor, I thought that too. I mean, just the first time somebody edits your work and is asking questions and telling you to do it a different way, you're like, who do you think you are? <laughs> this is my book, mister. This, this is, is my book. book. <laughs> this is right. And I, that happened every time. In the journey, every time a new person read it and gave me feedback, then I was not only defensive about, I thought I was right, but I was like, well, the last person told me to do it this way. (laughs) And it it took growth every time I had the same initial reaction with a new person. And then, yeah, but you read it for the third time, be like, okay. And then it is amazing. It's over the journey. I, I changed and they're like, look at you now. Because I was so holding on to what my original, you know, my original, this is my book. And then in the end, I was willing to, you know, another editor would offer an opinion and like, yeah, most of the time people don't do this. And I was like, okay, throw them all out. (laughs) I feel like there's a a, a parallel to the movie Groundhog Day in here somewhere, right? You kept getting annoyed with the editors over and over again. And finally you had that moment and then the day finally changed to you, right? Like in that movie, if you've ever seen it. With ben I, Murray, right? I compared the editing journey to that <laughs> right. editor. I was like, I feel like it's Groundhog's Day. I keep getting this back. I, I've seen it so many times. And the, the thought I like to share with people is trust the process, right? So I, before writing my own book, and I never read the acknowledgements for a book. And now I read them every time I pick up a book. And mm. because you realize there are so many people involved in making a book what it is. And it's not two people, <laughs> it's dozens, mm-hmm. right? The interviews, the people that gave you uns- you know, sort of thoughtful feedback, brainstorming sessions, things like this. And of course, the editing staff and the coaches, it's, it's really amazing how many people it takes to get a book done. So I love that uh, you, you started out with a little resistance, it sounds like, but you found a way there and learned something more about yourself and, and with the feedback. So the courageous mind, Angela, what is it you hope readers take away from your book? That courage is the key to achieving more success and happiness. We can borrow courage from others, learn to use it instinctively, and we lead best when we loan others our courage. I think many times we look at successful people and think they are in that courageous all the time. They're always doing it right. But I believe we all go through the cycle of needing to borrow courage, doing really well at using it, and then leading by loaning others courage. That research and all the stories really support that successful people train themselves to use courage and do it over and over again in facing their fears. When I was a little girl, my dad started training me to face my fears over and over on a regular basis. He would have me pick up snakes intentionally out of the yard, back a trailer, anything I was scared of, he had me do it over and over to learn how to face my fears and what that felt like. When I was in third grade, he set a goal of selling a thousand boxes of Girl Scout cookies for me. And I will never forget it. The uncomfortable feeling in my stomach when I put on my uniform and he would drag me along to all the places that he did business to ask people to buy cookies for me. At the time, I hated the process, like hated the process. But (laughs) that experience not only gave me a great sales training that served me well in my career, but it taught me what fear felt like. And it taught me what pushing through fear felt like. And when we know that we can embrace it and do it more often. And how do we do that? That's a takeaway of this book. How do we put ourselves in those environments and continue intentionally 
to face fears to achieve more. Courage is a muscle. We have to build it, have to create it, have to build it, and have to continue to grow it. And such an important lesson. I think that's why that the bicep emoji is one often so used when people do something amazing, right? That's yes. the, that's the emoji. Oh. People are like how courageous of you, right? Or tough. And it's it is being tough I because like you're that. right. You're facing these challenges, you're doing these different things, and you're ultimately growing and finding a better version of yourself to bring out to the world and to help others. And this concept of loaning your courage to others, I I think is so powerful. And it makes me think of a, a, a thought a mentor gave to me many years ago, which is if you really want to do something great in this world, he said, go create an opportunity for somebody else. Mm-hmm. And I've always taken that to heart. And, and I know I'm a mentor to a few folks and, and try to build upon that. But I think there's a corollary here with like, because when you're mentoring, you're lending other people your courage in many ways through your journey, your experience, your mistakes. And so what a beautiful message to share. Thank you for that. What is next for Angela Schroeder? The book's coming out spring, late spring, 2022. What's, what's, what's next for you, my friend? Yes, I'm excited to continue speaking, doing workshops for businesses and teams and working with individuals who want to grow their courage and grow their leadership and ultimately grow their lives. My mission really is to impact the most lives I can. And as I said, courage is contagious. So when you help people grow their own courage, you are creating a ripple effect of lives that they will impact. Growing courage. Love it. And it makes me think a little bit about this great quote you got from someone for your book, Van Deeb. This is one of the quotes, I think, on the back of your book, right? To be successful, we need to associate with like-minded people. And Angela Schroeder is a rock star in her space of helping others. If you're going to be in it, you might as well be the best at it. Angela has the tools and resources to get you there. How did it feel to get that quote from Van? Great. Van is a great mentor of mine and best-selling author and yeah, he's a like-minded person that has encouraged me to do more as well. That is awesome. Somebody who's encouraging you, pushing you, helping you, helping you grow. Angela's book, The Courageous Mind, will be available late spring 2022, wherever you buy books online. Angela, if people want to learn more about you and your story, where, where might they go? Yes, you can find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook at Angela Bang Schroeder and on the web, thecourageousmind.com. Absolutely incredible story, challenging ourselves, getting better, being more courageous, ultimately finding a better life for ourselves, a life for ourselves, taking more risks. And I think at the end of the day, delivering better results and feeling more inspired and connected to our work. What a great message. Thank you for sharing here today, Angela, and being on the show. Thanks for having me, John. Thank you. I'm your host of the creator community, John Saunders. Keep moving forward. 